Present. Jonathan Ruse. Daniel Jessup. Present. Leah Rodeberg. Present. And James Albert. Uh, we have a quorum and we are in order. Hmm. Is there a motion with respect to the minutes from our April 6th, 2023 meeting? I move Thank approval you. of the April 6th minutes. I second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Well, this is the, the time of the year for election of chair and vice chair. Mm. Are the nominations. Do we have to renominate you? Well, it, it's a it, yes, yearly vote. I nominate James Albert as chair. I second. Any other nominations? For the campaign disclosure board, our campaigns are pretty low key. Pretty easy. No big yard <laughs> signs. Any 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 other nominations? Well, all those in favor. Aye. 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 Can you fourth? I don't think so. I believe three and oh should be sufficient. Well, and you would be allowed to vote for yourself. You're not, unless well, you I want to refuse. A light about it, but <laughs> we don't want to be overturned by the Supreme Court on this. No, I'll, no. I'll vote for that guy. I promise <laughs> that not happen. I wrote, I wrote to work with him today. <laughs> well, thank you. What, you know, for the, for the members of the public, what, what, what we always say is there's no bad seat on this board. We we do this as a committee the whole. And listen to each other and and listen to our attorney as to what the what the law is, and we come together on everything. So it's an honor to it, it, it's an honor to be a part of that. We need a nomination for vice chair. I nominate Elaine Olson as vice chair. Is there a second? I'll second it. Any further nominations? Well, all those in favor. Aye. 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 I'll vote for her too. <laughs> <laughs> Then I think we're clean with the courts. <laughs> well, isn't it a joy to serve on this board? The I have felt that from my from my first year, and it's getting better every year. And here's one reason: the, the, the director's update. Oh, Elaine, did you want to? Oh, I, I was just going to echo the same thing, that it's an honor to serve. I appreciate the leadership of Zach and working under the leadership as well as Jim. I appreciate working with a team that takes consensus seriously and um, uh, works for the common good. Well, well, Zach, we'd like to uh, we'd like to hear more about these items that the uh, you're going to address here, especially the unpaid forfeitures from years past that we discussed last April and that you've taken action on. But the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, this one's going to be a bit longer than our usual updates because we haven't met since April, but thankfully all of the updates are good. So uh, it is a busy time of year for us, even though it is not a, uh, as active as the even years when it comes to campaigning. We still have 
school board and city campaigns that are in full swing right now through November. Uh, and with uh, everything seemingly becoming more political these days, we are seeing that, uh, that result in the activity, particularly with school board campaigns. They have become a lot more like what you might expect out of a state house campaign in recent years. Our county and local auditor, uh, Tim, has even said that much about how uh, he's so much busier with school board candidates now because they are campaigning at a level that they have not done in the past. All right. Well, as part of the broader reorganization effort that the governor has started with state government, the legislature had created a boards and commissions review committee and the committee's final recommendations were released a few days ago. And uh, for all the various boards, they recommended to either consolidate, modify, eliminate, or leave them as be. Uh, and our agency is not affected. Uh, I take that as a great vote of confidence for how this board has worked in the past and continues to work. Uh, and that is something that has not changed throughout the work of the committee and the initial round of recommendations and then the final report. Uh, they don't want to mess with us. Uh, there's always the potential for change. The governor has indicated that she will be putting a bill before the legislature uh, to enact some of the changes that the committee has recommended. Um, and, uh, and they've also indicated that the board and commission review process will be an ongoing uh, effort throughout the year. So it's not just a one ditch effort. Uh, they'll come back to it as they see it is necessary. Excuse me, Zane. Yes. For the record, Jonathan Bruce has just joined the, mm -hmm. the meeting. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. All right. Moving into some personnel updates for the board. Uh, Mary Reuter completed her second term on April 30th uh, and completed her service with us after 12 years. So I want to say thank you to Mary. Jonathan Ruse was reappointed to another six year term that'll take him through 2029. So we're glad to have him back. Sophia Scarfo completed her one year term as the agency's law clerk back in May. Uh, she was a great help to the agency and uh, learned a lot from when she was a first year student to going into her last year of law school. So I want to thank her as well. And last but certainly not least, Taylor McDonald joined our agency as assistant legal counsel back on the 15th of this month. Uh, like myself, she is returning to our agency. She interned here previously when she was a student at Drake Law School uh, under my predecessor, Megan Tooker. And so uh, if you want in mind, I'd like to turn it over to Taylor to introduce herself. Oh, please. Welcome. Thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Taylor McDonald. I am a 2015 graduate of Drake Law. Um, like Zach mentioned, I interned um, under Megan Tooker here for the board um, in 2012, summer of 2012. Um, and I am a um, since I've since um, completed a lobbying career um, and excited to join the board. Um, very interested in, in this work, uh, very interested in, in elections and, and campaigns, and um, I'm excited to be here. So happy to happy to serve as well. Yep. And I welcome. 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 And I, will, I will say it has not been even two full weeks since she joined, but the uh, the difference has been palpable, both for myself and I would say for everyone in the office. Uh, she brings a great energy and has been a great help. So uh, if you think things are good now, we're just going to keep getting better now that she's here. Okay. Moving on to, oh, and I should also say, if at any point throughout the update, feel free to interrupt me with questions. Um, moving on to our office space. So along with the reorganization of state government, there has been a big upheaval with where agencies are physically located on the Capitol complex. Uh, one note of that, they are considering selling and then demolishing the Wallace building, which is down the street and purchasing a new building. Uh, we are staying put as well, thankfully, uh, but they do have plans for renovations of the entire wing of our building for our part, our office space, and then for the other agencies, uh, which would all be other independent boards. Uh, so we would be among our peers. Uh, that would cover carpet, blinds, fresh paint, new furniture. They were originally scheduled to be done in August and completed no later than September 1st. Uh, due to some things out of our control uh, that has been delayed. I have been given reassurances from the Department of Administrative Services that it will be completed by the end of this year. When it happens, uh, we will be fully remote for approximately two weeks. That's what they've told me. At the most, I would hope no more than three weeks. We all know how construction can go, um, but uh, we have the technology and our staff have been used to working remotely in the past, so it will not affect uh, any of the services we provide. 
the building doors, uh, the, the final decision has been made. Uh, they've been locked since COVID started back in 2020, uh, but they will remain locked permanently now. You'll need badge access to come into our building. Uh, that's for security purposes, so we don't have random people wandering around our office like we have had in times past. Um, and also just for our own efficiencies. When we're working remotely, we don't want someone showing up to the office expecting to meet with us. Uh, we've moved to an appointment only basis for in-person in meetings with the board, or board staff, I should say. Technology, uh, we've continued to make enhancements to the web reporting system. Uh, the vacancy in Taylor's position for the last few months of fiscal year 23 uh, were used to add new features and enhancements to the web reporting system. Uh, the result is for our auditors who spend the vast majority of their workday working within the system and for the public on the other side of the coin, uh, it's been greatly improved since we initially launched back in March of 2022. This fall, we were originally going to have a brand new redesigned ethics.iowa.gov website. Uh, we refer to that as our public facing website. Uh, that has been delayed. The new launch date for that is April 9th, 2024. Uh, next week, we're beginning the process of going through all of our content, revising any language. Uh, and uh, the last time this was done was 2018, 2019. Since then, we've migrated some of our uh, systems from that public facing website onto the WRS. So the final result of the new website should be something that is uh, significantly simplified, easier to navigate. Uh, what I say with our technology is I want to make it so the most technologically incompetent person can use it with no real issue. So that's our goal with the website. Excuse me. I yes. think it would be helpful for for the board to you know see some of this, test it out ourselves, test drive it at a board meeting. Yes. The uh, and let's see what the what the uh, you know what it's like as a, as a user, as a member of the public. Let's let's. Let's hook it up here one, one afternoon. Absolutely. Uh, if you want, real quick, I can show you uh, well, one feature. get it fixed. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, another modernization effort, we are officially switching from having office landlines to cell phones. Uh, it, it is an additional cost. It's about $660 annually more to have cell phones for each individual person. Uh, but the issue that we face right now with our landlines is the only way for us to receive uh, calls that go into our work number is to use an app called WebEx that forwards the calls onto our personal cell phones. Um, and the app, unfortunately, has significant problems, you know, connection issues, dropped calls. And so uh, we thought that this was a no brainer, uh, slightly increased cost. Uh, but at the same time, we were able to get all the cell phones for free. Uh, Verizon has worked out contracts with several other state agencies. Cell phones have been the norm for a lot of other bigger agencies that have more resources. Uh, so we are expecting next week we'll be getting uh, everyone an iPhone 13. Everyone picked out their own favorite color. Uh, and all that hardware was free. That was a significant savings. I think otherwise it would have been something like six or $700 for each cell phone. So we got it down to zero with the help of our guy at Verizon. All right. After almost a year of work, uh, never would have guessed it would take so long, but our office now has Wi-Fi. As we have moved to laptops, as we are now getting smartphones to use for our work, Wi-Fi was, in my personal opinion, just one of those things that has become so commonplace uh, that uh, we expect it. And so we now have uh, blazing fast Wi-Fi over at our office, and uh, we look forward to using that more and more. Moving on to the budget. This week, we submitted our budget request for fiscal year 2025 to the Department of Management. The Department of Management will review and then take it to the governor's office for their recommendations to the legislature. The total request is for $876,822. Uh, this is an unusual increase. It's an increase of just over $103,000 or 13% year over year. The last increase we got was two years ago. Uh, for about $50,000. That was for the required annual maintenance fee for the new web reporting system. Um, when I went over to the legislature, the quick soundbite I used there was, we spent a million dollars building the WRS, now we just need to invest $50,000 each year to make sure that it is maintained and that the system doesn't crash. Uh, 
that cost went up just as the technology has become more elaborate uh, and it requires more maintenance. The reason why we are requesting a significant 13% increase to our budget is because historically, since 2016, we have more often than not had at least one vacant staff position in our agency. Uh, we added it up and five and a half years of those seven years, we had a vacancy. Uh, additionally, uh, throughout most of 2022, my salary was less than what it was budgeted for, so that provided for a cushion. During that same time in 2019, uh, Director Tooker uh, at that point worked with the Department of Management to add the second attorney position. Uh, that was done at the uh, insistence of the Department of Management, who felt that we needed additional staff, uh, which uh, we still appreciate to this day. So essentially, we have been getting by with seven full-time employees, but we've only had funding for six. And about 86% of the $103,000 increase is purely for salary expenses, uh, not only for the attorney position that we had added a few years ago, uh, but also to keep pace with other things like uh, annual performance-based raises, which are typically around 3%. Uh, this year's across the board raise for all state employees, which is mandatory, was also 3%. Uh, several of our auditors have been here quite a while. And so as the salary needs build, uh, it is just uh, unfortunately not entirely realistic to not spend a penny more year over year in an agency that is as lean as ours. We don't have extra fat. We don't have hundreds of employees where a vacancy is almost certain to happen. We don't get any federal funds. We rely on the general fund. Uh, and so that is the impetus uh, for 86% of that request. Another 10% is for regular enhancements to the WRS. My opinion on this software is we get so many good ideas from uh, internally within our agency, from around the state, from our user base, campaign officials, government officials, just the public who are interested. Uh, I know the media often look at our systems as well. Uh, and so just like the software on your iPhone, you get updates every single year, new features, ways to improve it. And so uh, I thought it would be a good idea to request $10,000 more, which would account for 80 hours of work a year for our developer to add new features. Um, with this increased request, I do wanna note that our funding is still very much on par with our counterparts in similarly sized states. Uh, so we are not ballooning to a point that is unreasonable for a state of our size uh, or an agency with our responsibilities. Uh, my goal uh, is simply to provide the high quality services to the state that we are used to, uh, while also remaining as lean as possible and responsible with our funding because it does come from the taxpayers. You know, with respect to that, the point that you made earlier resonated with me, and that is how competitive, you know, races for school board, for instance, have become in terms of even you know raising money, the uh, and the and of course the reports that have to be filed with us. I would think that would be an argument that we could make that our work has increased, yep. the work of our auditors has increased as as you know campaigns that used to be sleepers mm -hmm. have become competitive, requiring so much more auditing on our part. The uh, we are a lean agency, mm -hmm. always always have been. The reason that that the uh, what Dave Roder, the, the Department of Management a few years ago supported our second attorney position was because how much we had done with one attorney and the fact that I combined the position of executive director with our with our staff attorney. We went from two positions to one and we saved the state hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years. Mm -hmm. So that was the argument that, you know, what are you talking about? We're just talking about going back to where we started. 20 years yeah, combined. We, yeah, we saved the state so much money mm -hmm. by combining executive director position with our attorney position that it was only right that they, that they support, you know, a second attorney position, but, but you know, we have a good reputation for being lean. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the auditors, yeah, executive director, you know, the uh, you know, the results speak for themselves, you know, the number of audits that, that are done here. But this is a lean agency. Yep. 
And to that point, just as the former director of the Senate State Government Committee, uh, completely unprompted, he said, well, you guys might need more staff. And I said, it would be great to have another auditor as the auditing load does increase. So that might be on the horizon within the next few years. Uh, the penalty enforcement project that we discussed last time, I have that later on the agenda today since it is uh, more in depth. So we'll come back to that in a little bit after we tend to the other business. Uh, updates on our outreach. At the state level, uh, I've given presentations and candidate schools uh, for associations such as the Iowa Farm Bureau, the Iowa Association of School Boards. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, Taylor and I went over to the Department of Natural Resources and presented on the government ethics laws to their uh, Environmental Protection Commission. And uh, the DNR has said that that went so well that they want us to come back and talk to their other commissions uh, where the officials are uh, making important decisions and uh, they wanna make sure that they're up and up on the ethics laws. Our agency is also working with Iowa PBS so that they can get the relevant campaign finance information they need. They use that to determine who is going to appear in the televised debates uh, next year, particularly for the uh, legislature, and then in 2026 for the statewide uh, campaigns. Uh, and so we'll work with them continue to give them the resources they need. Uh, we're also working with the governor's office. Next month, we're meeting with the general counsels from all of the governor's cabinet agencies to ensure that they are aware of the government ethics requirements so that we can prevent any potential issues you know, related to conflicts of interest, filing ethics reports, such as personal financial disclosures. Uh, all this outreach is done with the idea of reducing uh, compliance issues on the back end. We wanna make sure that people are aware they have to file a personal financial disclosure every year, uh, even if they do leave state employment during that year. And overall, the pandemic, with most things, uh, it also affected our presentations. Uh, and so we didn't do them for a while, but now we're back at it. And uh, I would say comfortably, that we are at our pre-pandemic level, but especially now since we have additional help, we look forward to doing more outreach and going above the pre-COVID levels. Uh, what that's gonna look like is more communication with county auditors so we can get information through the pipeline to more local candidates. We're gonna work with party leaders. We're gonna develop training materials. In the past, our agency has put out guides for candidates for different offices, city council, school board, uh, based on what I was able to find that has not been done in about a decade. So we need some updating there and we will be able to hopefully reduce additional problems as we are more proactive with our outreach. So that's at the state level. Nationally, uh, as I believe I previously reported, our agency recently rejoined the Council on Governmental Ethics Laws, otherwise known as COGL. Uh, it's the National Association for Agencies that Enforce Ethics, Campaign Finance, Lobbying, and also other things such as Freedom of Information Laws. Uh, we were previously a member until roughly 2010, uh, but uh, budget cuts made us drop the membership. We're now back in it. Uh, the annual dues are $445. For that, we get an annual conference. We get monthly roundtables. Just this past week, the entire agency watched a roundtable uh, where we saw updates on technology across the nation uh, for web reporting, essentially, for campaigns. And uh, that was able to offer some very interesting insights that led us with the clear impression that here in Iowa, we're on the cutting edge of things. In Mississippi, they're building a new WRS like we were doing a few years ago, except their old WRS was in such bad shape, they had to shut it down and they are now back to paper filing until their new WRS launches. California is beginning their process to build the system. Since we rejoined and our contact information has been out there, we've had other states like Maine reach out to us and ask who we use for our developer. And so uh, the increased communication and collaboration with our counterparts is not only gonna help them, but it's also gonna help us as we look at uh, issues as they come up, such as uh, the use of artificial intelligence in campaigns. That's a hot button issue right now that's before the Federal Election Commission. Uh, so we wanna stay up on that. And uh, I would say for $445 a year, it's a good value. And you can put questions to all of your counterparts across the country like those that, that you know, we're facing, you know, how do you collect, how do you collect funds? What, right. what mechanisms do your states have? Mm -hmm. Isn't that one of the advantages of COGOL? Correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking into the future, one of the big questions that we know we're going to have to reckon with someday, and it's fast approaching, 
all of our transactions are associated with a check number. We need to be prepared and have a, a plan for when checks are no longer the dominant way where campaigns receive contributions and make expenditures. Uh, and so that'll be one of the more overarching issues that this membership will certainly help with uh, and we'll be able to do it uh, in step with our counterparts. Uh, it's a bit unusual to say that we have an update on international outreach, but I'm proud to say that we do. In late April, I joined a U.S. delegation to Taiwan that was sponsored by the U.S. State Department and the American Council of Young Political Leaders. Uh, a couple other people who were on that delegation include a Senate staffer from the Pennsylvania State Senate, uh, a Wisconsin State Senator, a couple of government relations professionals, one from Target, one from American Family Insurance, uh, a county attorney, and a former D.C. staffer who is now an executive at Google. So it was a fantastic group. We explored general issues and uh, we did have time to address issues particular to our uh, positions. So I can now say that I have plenty of insight on Taiwanese ethical laws and uh, also campaign finance regulation. Uh, and then in July, I traveled to the Philippines. That was also sponsored by the State Department uh, in conjunction with the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative. And that was a reciprocal project. You might remember last year, last fall, we had Marlon Hinan, who was here from the Philippines, learning from our agency. Uh, and thankfully, the funding was available federally for me to go over there and uh, have the same experience. We implemented what was called Project Mini-Me, which was focused on 20 extraordinary young leaders in, throughout the Philippines uh, who are interested in public service. We focused on the importance of ethical governance, anti-corruption laws, accountability, transparency, uh, and for some more information, I included an article in the board packets uh, that came from the National Government of the Philippines that highlights our agency's role in bringing that project to reality. Uh, and uh, both of these trips are unusual for someone in my position to go on. Uh, so I'm extremely appreciative to the organizations that made it happen, to this board and to our staff for uh, allowing me and providing me the support to go abroad and uh, not only have some fun, but also do some very meaningful work. Um, uh, I did not go on these trips because of who I am. I went because I serve in this position uh, and I just was fortunate enough to be the most conspicuous person for those trips. So uh, thank you. It was a great honor to represent the board on the other side of the world. On October 10th, uh, we will be receiving a delegation of eight individuals from Jordan. Uh, this trip is being coordinated with the Iowa International Center and the US State Department. They reached out to me and asked for a meeting we're gonna meet over at the Capitol in the old Supreme Court chamber where I will present on our agency, how we do things here in Iowa uh, and generally have a conversation and a, a Q and A period about uh, the public's trust in government and uh, how we make sure that the government in Iowa stays clean. Uh, the overall project of their trip is about promoting electoral integrity. And so they'll be meeting with other officials including Secretary of State Pate uh, and uh, plenty of others. So hopefully they'll have some good ideas from us here in the Midwest, they can take back to the Middle East. With that, the only other things I would say, uh, a reminder that we have our next meeting set for Thursday, November 16th at the same time, one o'clock. Uh, we have some new business that's come in since this agenda went out this week as a symptom of the busy campaign time we're in right now. We will finalize our 2024 legislative proposals. If there's interest for the board, I'm more than happy to do what I did last year and get a staff survey so you can conduct a performance review of myself. Uh, and then I've also been talking with the governor's office for us to do something to acknowledge the 50th and 30th anniversaries of our agency. The 50th anniversary of the campaign finance part of it, and then the 30th anniversary of the ethics part of it. Uh, we certainly want to uh, use this occasion to uh, commemorate all the great work that the board has done throughout the years. So uh, to wrap it all up, we're busier than ever, and we also have a lot of big projects going on that are really once in a generation changes. Um, I think it's all for the better. I think we're making our agency over from top to bottom in a way that needs to be done so we can better serve Iowa. Uh, the feedback from the public as I go around the state has been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, and uh, as I come up on an anniversary in this position, it'll be two years before I know it. I just wanna say to everyone on the staff and the board, thank you. All these great things that I get to report on are because of their hard work. And so I am extremely appreciative to be able to keep work hard at this work that is very much worth doing. So thank you.
Thank you very much. Questions? Comments? Elaine? I'm just, I just wanted to respond that he's been a busy person as the face of this committee. And uh, I want to extend our gratitude to him for that. Thank you, Elaine. I appreciate that. I'll just echo excellent report. Thank you for all the, the great work that you and the staff are doing and, and um, happy second anniversary coming up here. <laughs> Yeah, um, so on the white here, we're able to rejoin that organization. Um, do they have a website? To, uh, they do. I think it's just kogol.org, but uh, if you all would like, I can send a link out to their homepage uh, so you can poke around and uh, see what they're about. Their annual conference this year is in Kansas City. I'm going down in December. Thankfully, we don't have to worry about buying any plane tickets this year. Um, and so uh, it'll be, I think it's a four or five day conference. Um, and uh, the sessions that they've previewed are going to be very applicable to our work and i think it's going to be a great experience so the membership consists of uh agencies boards like ours and the other states right it's other states uh, a lot of cities bigger cities like uh, san francisco or new york they would have their own uh, version of us since they have so many people to oversee uh, and then it also is not just the united states it is also canada uh, so we're uh, we get some insight as to how they do things up there which is uh, as you can imagine, radically different in some cases, but nevertheless, good to hear different ideas. Any other comments or questions? Well, let's move into uh, complaints then. First, the city of Dune. We've read your, your memo detailing the facts and the law that applies here. Any questions of Zach? The, we, we visited this, you recall, in April. They uh, accepted it for legal sufficiency for purposes of investigating it. And, and as Zach notes here, he did investigate it. The staff investigated it and found that that uh, this mailing was not paid for by the city, but, but by a foundation, correct? Correct. So this didn't involve the expenditure of public funds for this political purpose. Correct. Was well, there uh, any questions of, of Zach about that investigation? Well, based on, on the findings of it, is there a motion with respect to uh, this complaint? Motion to dismiss. Second. Second. And to motion to dismiss for lack of legal sufficiency. The investigation. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Well, the second. Cedar Rapids Community School District. Well, Zach, the, uh, I want to briefly summarize the, you know, the threshold, the threshold requirements the, uh, for a complaint of, of uh, this nature. The, Yeah, so the Cedar Rapids Community School District is looking to pass a bond referendum uh, to get funding for additional schools and improvements. Uh, it's fairly typical. We've seen a lot of them throughout the state this year for both schools and cities uh, and also some counties. Uh, and here they have been using public emails to solicit volunteers to collect signatures to get the uh, bond issue on the ballot to make it a official ballot issue. Uh, I attach exhibit A for some uh, examples of the emails that have been coming from the school district email accounts, uh, including a Facebook post from their official page. Uh, and I will also note that this formal complaint is not the only individual who has reached out to our agency with concerns. We have heard from a handful of people in Cedar Rapids who are concerned, uh, but what the law says 
It's Iowa Code Section 68A505 that prohibits the use of public resources for political purposes. And the way the law defines political purposes is quite narrow. Uh, so political purpose has to be expressed advocacy, but before we even get into that question, uh, the prohibition is on the expenditure of public monies, including uh, the advocacy for the passage or defeat of a ballot issue. A reminder, their communications have been to solicit volunteers to get the issue on the ballot. It is not legally a ballot issue until they have collected those petitions, turned them in by the required date, and it is set for the voters to vote on in December. So because it's still in those early stages, it is not a violation of either our laws or the administrative rules. So without there being a ballot issue, these the statute and the regulation don't kick in, is that right? Correct. And this is one of those instances where uh, it's fairly common for people to contact our office when they see something that just looks fishy. Um, and uh, the question I often get is, well, this is inappropriate to be using public resources for this bond referendum. Uh, obviously, some citizens are opposed to it. And the answer that I always have to give is we don't enforce what is and what is not appropriate. We enforce what the law says. And so I completely understand why some people would view the use of these public resources as inappropriate. Uh, I cannot say that I would do the same if I were in their shoes. But at the end of the day, when we apply the law to it, uh, the conclusion is clear that it is not a violation. Well, so it's advocacy for a proposed ballot. Correct. That's cutting it pretty thin, in my opinion. It is. Yeah. It's it's using public resources to advocate for placing mm -hmm. a, an issue on the ballot. Yep. And that's and exactly to, why to, I would not do it if I were them. But but it's it's a pretty that's a pretty thin slice mm -hmm. because the law prohibits expressly advocating the passage of mm -hmm. the. Uh, so we're saying that. This law isn't violated because there's not a valid issue. There isn't an issue on the ballot that can be passed or defeated. The uh, the city is using public resources, public funds, to advocate for the placement of an issue on the ballot. Well, that's a pretty that's a pretty thin slice in my view. Is there is there case law in this that draws a distinction between passage? And, and and the placement of an issue before the voters eventually vote on it? Uh, the only case law, nothing in the courts, but what the board has ruled in the past is that uh, if it's not officially approved uh, to be placed on the ballot, then it is it doesn't qualify as something that is prohibited. An example we've had here in Des Moines is the Polk County Board of Supervisors uh, just recently approved a ballot issue for additional airport funding uh, and the airport called and asked and they wanted to put out information that wasn't as one-sided in its advocacy as what we're seeing here with the Cedar Rapids School District. Um, but uh, that's the most common kind of uh, coming close to the line that we see where if a city has a ballot issue for a local option sales tax, they will put out a mailer and they'll say, you know, uh, if this passes, here's what will happen. If this doesn't pass, Here's what will happen. Some people uh, take my advice when I give it to them and say, be as neutral as possible. If you just want to inform the public, that's fine. That's not going to draw the ire of citizens. Um, but uh, unfortunately, some of them will use words that pretty clearly indicate which side they're on. This is where we run into that issue of, again, the way that uh, the code defines political purpose and express advocacy. It is a relatively high bar to meet where you need to say, defeat this at the polls vote yes for this person. Uh, it cannot just be something that's more vague, such as, well, wouldn't it be nice to have a new playground at our school? It goes back to the Eighth Circuit's definition of express advocacy. It has to be you know, advocating either the defeat or the passage of a specific issue. And this isn't that. This is advocating the placement of something on a ballot, not saying we want you to support it or oppose it. It's saying we're, we want, we're going to use public resources to put something on the ballot. 
And that is not express advocacy. And I will also say, because we uh, have a lot of government entities who push for something like this to try and further their own agenda, what I always remind them of is, even though I might not, uh, uh, even though I advise them against it in these early stages, I do remind them that as soon as it is placed on the ballot, if we see something like this, then it is a game changer. That was going to be my question. Have Have you had any communications with the um, Cedar Rapids School District about this? Yeah. Or okay. Yep, I uh, I, I discussed it. Uh, the uh, The school board secretary reached out to me initially, uh, and then uh, I worked one on one with their council, who is based here in Des Moines at the Allers and Cooney firm, uh, and uh, they were insistent. They did not want to uh, uh, stop doing this, which is given their position, it is understandable, I suppose. Um, but uh, it was one of those instances where, uh, even though I advise against it, uh, the law does allow for it. And I do know the the chair of that committee that um, he's, he used to be a colleague of mine that is um, leading that volunteer effort. Um, so I just wanted to make sure if there's been communication so that they don't cross that line, you know, in the future here. Right. And Leah, since you're our woman on the ground over there, uh, I know that the signatures were due, I believe, on September 22nd. Have you heard anything if they met the requirement? So it is now a ballot issue. You know, that I was just thinking the same thing that I hadn't heard anything. Um, so I'll I'll follow up on that to see. But I haven't heard that they didn't get the signatures. OK, but there has been a lot of talk about this over here. Um, I'm not in that district. Um, I don't live in that district, but obviously work in the Cedar Rapids area. So I've heard a lot about this um, topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is is there is there any way in our um, uh, de determination to express the concern or wonderment of that this? No, it did not break the law, but be careful. <laughs> I don't know how to say that legally, but but mm -hmm. uh, just a wonderment of just exploring, uh, expressing a concern. You know, does I was thinking the same thing, Jonathan. You, the, uh, you know, this is. We've had so many cases over the years that have come so close to the line but haven't crossed it. It's such a high bar, express it because, because of the First Amendment. The, uh, and it, it, the, uh, we've, the, um, and, and how oh, the, um, unless there's actual, unless the advocacy is, uh, you know, vote for or vote against this person, or vote for or vote against this ballot issue. It isn't express advocacy. And and therefore this you know this prohibition doesn't kick in. Uh, but boy, can't you remember the, the number of times where where like here it's come close, mm -hmm. but unless it crosses the line, it isn't the law isn't violated. But Elaine's question is, can can our concern be expressed? I guess you've done that to the Cedar Rapids school, right? Right. And if the board is interested, what I would think would be the most effective and uh, simple option to uh, carry out what you're talking about, Elaine, is a letter from the board where we essentially express while this is not a violation, it is something we strongly discourage. And we do have some precedent for that, uh, not only with the more informal actions we've taken throughout the years, but also in the code. For, uh, for the gift law section of the code, the legislature did something that it does not have, that it did not do in any other section, where it put a narrative paragraph at the beginning explaining why they're doing it, why it is so important for government officials to uh, be skeptical about any gifts, and the language, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, I don't have the code memorized yet, but I'm getting there, um, is something along the lines that even if there is not a true conflict of interest, even if it's just the appearance of impropriety, it still undermines the public's trust in government 
And so uh, I think that is absolutely something that we could express to the school district to say that uh, the law might not be violated, but the spirit of the law is still very important. Well, as much as I, I, I like some of that, I think this requires further legal analysis. The difference here is the First Amendment. And the expressed advocacy, it, it is, this is a hard line. This is not one of those things like, like conflict of interest and, and the appearance of impropriety. This isn't that. This is, it's a very hard line when it comes to the First Amendment and whether something is expressed advocacy. And the courts are, are absolutely unforgiving in government regulation of speech that doesn't cross the line. There is no, there is no give on that. I think it requires some, some further analysis. Why don't you come back to us and see what options we might have when something comes this close? Yeah, absolutely. We'll have that ready for November. You know, we've, we've Zach, tried to do it. You know, the one case we lost over the years was when we, when we decided, well, this just doesn't seem right. And we went and it was, we just, the, let's make sure we're right on the law. But this isn't one of those things where the public is, you know, Zach, I was going to tell you, I just found a post that they were successful in getting um, 7,624 signatures, so it will be on the November ballot. Right. Thank you, Leah. Yep. You know, the board members are investigating these things as an enhancement. <laughs> I mean, that is value added. <laughs> and as far as I'm concerned, the $50 that you get for this meeting isn't enough. <laughs> you can reach you can reach in your own pocket and help us out. <laughs> we, we should have. this is this is a first. Well so the let's let's do some research on how you know what we can do when there's something that comes this close because Jonathan and I have felt the same for so many years about so many cases. This mm -hmm. is just but it comes so close it doesn't get across the line. Mm -hmm. But for this one, the uh, it is uh, uh, it's been moved and seconded to dismiss this for lack of legal sufficiency because it doesn't rise to the level of express advocacy because there was no no valid issue in existence. It's been moved and seconded, correct? I think we still need a motion. I think we still need, we still a, need a motion. Is there a motion? I so move. I'll second it. All right. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. All good discussion. Well, we have these petitions for waivers of civil penalties. Is there anyone who wants to pull any of these out of the block to discuss to discuss them individually? I uh, had one. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Sorry, and I had one question on um, Gorman for Iowa. Is that the same um, Gorman for Iowa that we see on the delinquent? Or is that the same? That's the same amount, the same one. That's the same one since the penalty okay. is still a, a penalty until any actions taken. And okay, perfect. I just wanted to make could, sure it wasn't another one. Right. Yeah. And if I could, before any action is taken, uh, I know I sent to you, Leah and Elaine, and I included in the board packet for the members here. Uh, this document of circumstances that have justified a waiver or reduction of penalty in the past. This was given to me by my predecessor. Uh, the board makeup has obviously changed since then. Uh, you know, consistency is important, but I will just say, uh, I wanted to check in since it has been uh, two years at this point, uh, how the board feels about these uh, seven situations. If we need to uh, amend it in any way so that we have a clear cut uh, guiding document on how to handle these unique situations. And I believe we've talked about this since our new board members have joined us. And hasn't this yep. been? Yep. yep. We talked about it last yeah. meeting, I believe. Yeah, we talked about it before. Okay. Well, do you want to pull out the uh, Gorman for Iowa, Leah? 
No, no. I just had a question if that was in addition or if that was the only one. Elaine, do you want to pull any out? Well, I was struck by the amount mm -hmm. of the LSCP um, Little Sioux corn processors one. And that was that amount just struck me as very high, and I just was looking for an explanation, I suppose. Right. So for the out-of-state committees who might be a state committee in another state or registered with the Federal Election Commission, any, since they're not registered with our office, anytime they make a contribution to an Iowa committee that we regulate, they have to file a verified statement of registration. If they don't, uh, they are penalized for each contribution they make. So for a PAC such as uh, the Little Sioux Corn Processors, they give contributions to several different campaigns. Uh, and so that's why there were, I think it's 61. 61, uh, yeah. Yeah, $1,525. Um, they uh, gave a lot of contributions and they did not file. Uh, but I will note just so that uh, we aren't left with the wrong impression. When you file a VSR, you don't have to do a separate filing for each and every contribution. If you're making 60 contributions on one day, you just have to list each campaign and then you can file it at once. But the way the rules are written, uh, it does kind of break out each one and deliver a separate penalty for each contribution. That way, if someone gives a thousand campaign contributions on one filing, it's not just a $25 penalty. It, that one would be a, a $25,000 one. So, uh, you know, this is an out of state PAC that chose to, you know, contribute to, to uh, what these, these candidates, the, the uh, you know, the, uh, this is a this is an entity that has legal representation and and knows what it's doing it it it, it wants to influence you know, elections in our state and you know, i don't think it's asking too much that they that they learn the law of iowa and the and the, and the campaign laws of iowa if they want to campaign in iowa this is i mean they're corn processors like they uh they've got lawyers this is well so, we're, we're we're for the other ones it's all consistent with 25 dollars per um contribution so we're being consistent with that amount for everyone yeah and uh to the point that the chair just made uh i i include the waiver request forms which i will note this time next year they should be digitized we should not have to deal with handwriting anymore that'll be another modernization that i I'm very much looking forward to, um, but uh, uh, Jim was exactly right where if it's a volunteer treasurer for a city council campaign and they uh, forget to do this or that, uh, it's for me personally, I'm more sympathetic to that than uh, a PAC who some of them are based in Washington, D.C. and hire fancy law firms to be compliant with state laws and uh, uh, in those situations. And I think we have a few more in this batch, actually, um, where it's uh, their job to do it. They are not doing it on a volunteer basis. Um, that certainly plays into the recommendations that you have before you. Elaine, did you have any more questions about that item that? No, I just was, uh, it, the amount just caught my eye. Yeah. Yeah, we usually don't see them that high. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. I have just a couple of questions. Do you have any that you want to pull uh, out? No, go ahead. Do you have any? On Gorman, he says, to my knowledge, I'm at the deadline. Is that wrong? Uh, if he has knowledge, uh, usually we require some kind of evidence of that. Uh, otherwise, the explanation of uh, the pandemic happening, because this is one of those from the backlog. This is from 2020. This was for the May 19th, 2020 report. The uh, excuse of the campaign was restructuring because of COVID. Two months later, after the pandemic officially began, uh, that's what played into the recommendation here. Uh, and uh, there are a few others where uh, they might say, well, we have record of filing it on time. They don't provide us the notes that they did. say they have, and, and he did not. I have a question about the uh, friends of Lawrence Marshall. Yes. 
the reason he cites is the, the death of his great grandmother and uncle. Yes. I thought that brought it within the, you know, within that category, within yep. that basis for waiver of this. Yeah. And then, are we saying that it has to be a, I mean, why, why, uh, why not waive it for the death of the, of the, because it just says family in our circumstances. It doesn't, I think what I hear you saying is, are we how saying close, yeah. what, how close yeah, of a family it, member? Right. Degree of consanguinity, how close? Yeah. I mean, the, and the other fact that I looked at was the time when the report was due uh, and the time of the deaths that he cited. Um, and I'll, I also want to say that for situations like these, these are the toughest recommendations where, you know, I, I try to balance what the law says and what we've done in the past with someone who is obviously uh, grieving and it's, uh, uh, it's a, a tough recommendation to make. But uh, I will always err on the side of enforcement. And then if the board sees fit, to change that, that's, that's your we, prerogative. That's why we do this. But I think Dan is right. The, you know, our exception says family. It doesn't say spouse or, or parent. And, you know, we've all been close to grandparents. Grandparent, I mean, the, uh, so I'd like to hold that out. And I've got one other question. Plan three to... Plan three to stay free. Yes. They need a different name. Uh, is, that, is there a, a regulation about confusing names? Uh, the main regulation, and we've been discussing it since Taylor came on board with committee names because the law I'm only kidding. says. I'm uh, kidding. I do have a quick note if, if you want uh, an interesting legal question we had about the First Amendment. We had a pack file with our office uh, that use a profane word in their committee name. Um, it was uh, uh, the B word. They get stuff done. That was the name of the pack. And it was something, you know, I wasn't sure if we should approve that. We had no rule that said that you cannot use profane word. The, what, what I relied on was the Secretary of State for business filings. I looked it up and there are plenty of business filings where the ITCH is in the business name, so we determined to let that pack uh, have that name. Well, with respect to this, the, what they say is that they selected the wrong committee type on our web-based reporting system. Mm -hmm. Is there any indication that that was because of something that on our end, that, that they were misled by it? No. That was a confusion with the regulation. They originally selected uh, to be a political action committee where they wanted to be a local ballot issue committee. This was for the supervisor redistricting plan over in Pottawatomie County. So it was for a specific election um, that they wanted to advocate in. And then afterwards they wanted to uh, wrap it up. Uh, and so uh, originally the PAC filing deadline would not have been until January. This election was uh, on August 8th. Uh, and so because they didn't file at that time, that's why they missed it. Was it was on them rather than us. That's the only right. getting it. One of those situations where if they had called, we would have been able to sort it out. Then the only one I'd like to hold out and vote on separately is friends of Lawrence Marshall. Does anybody else have anyone that they want to pull out of the lot? Was there a motion then with respect to those waiver requests in the block? Motion to accept the executive director's recommendation with respect to all of those. I'll move that uh, motion to accept the executive directors uh, with the exception of Lawrence Marshall. Uh, this time. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? I'll second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. The uh, well, then, with respect to friends of Lawrence Marshall, is there a motion? Is there a motion to waive the, the penalty? I move to waive. Is there a second?
Is there a second to waive this penalty because of death of the great grandmother? I think Leah did. I think Leah. I'm muted. Oh. Sorry. Second. Oh, <laughs> oh you're sorry. You read her lips. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> trying to reduce noise, but sorry. <laughs> well, it's been moved and seconded uh, to waive the penalty. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. No, thanks, everyone. Well, now on to discussion of these board policies. Zach? Yep. Uh, real quick before the board policy, um, Leah and Elaine, I just want to check in on the tech side. The sound quality is okay. Everything is all right. Yeah, very okay, good. good. Thank you. And uh, if anyone's watching the YouTube live stream, if you have any comments or feedback, email us at ethicsboard at iowa.gov if you have any problems. Anyway, uh, yes. Uh, so the first item under discussion of board policies. We recently, our auditors discovered an inconsistency with how some contributions are being reported. Uh, this addresses what the technical term is, it's consumable campaign property, uh, which is stationary yard signs, t-shirts, any campaign material that has been, quote, permanently imprinted to be specific to a candidate or an election. So if, uh, if Senator Grassley dropped off a bunch of his signs to the Polk County Republican Party, uh, to distribute to uh, people who want a yard sign or t-shirts for a parade or something like that. In our administrative rules right now, when committees report campaign property, there is a specific exemption that I've highlighted uh, that you do not have to report consumable campaign property when you file that schedule uh, of your report with our office. However, if you look on the in-kind contribution rule, it says the committee shall report the amounts of all in-kind contributions, which is simply anything that has value. And yard signs, t-shirts, uh, they do have some value. Uh, and the way we caught it was we had a federal committee who was filing VSRs with our office every time they dropped off $500 worth of t-shirts to uh, a county party. Uh, and uh, so we were not seeing that being reported by the county party. Uh, it typically has not been, uh, but some federal committees have done that. And so uh, we worked with uh, people both at the county level and then the state parties were concerned because a lot of their county uh, branches have not had to report this in the past. And they say that for many instances, it would be uh, unrealistic and uh, overly cumbersome. And so uh, we discussed it amongst our staff. Uh, what I would recommend and what I want your input on is the idea of adding a specific exemption to reporting in-kind contributions for that consumable campaign property. An idea we had was to have a threshold. If it's above $500, then you have to report it. We had some ideas where don't report it at all, um, but uh, just wanted to get the board's thought on that because that would be uh, a policy change. What's consumable? That's uh, yard signs, t-shirts. The, the definition we have in the rules is anything that has been permanently imprinted to be okay. specific to a candidate or election. And I think the layman's explanation there is if I'm giving a laptop to a state Senate campaign, that has a lot of value. They could use that. Uh, but if uh, 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 Congressman Zach Nunn gives a bunch of his t-shirts, you know, the usability and the, uh, the value of something like that might not be there if he's not running next time. Uh, and so I think that's why there was an exception uh, when reporting the campaign property, just because the value might not always be there. Or uh, a lot of other times, it is not regarded by a lot of the receiving committees to be a true contribution. Uh, they see themselves as just kind of the middleman, the pass through, where you'll drop off some t-shirts and then we'll hand it out to our supporters or we'll throw them at parades. Uh, yeah. I think Elaine makes a good point. I mean, that is a very confusing term. I mean, how, do, how does the public, how would somebody running for office know what a consumable mm -hmm. campaign item is? Right. Is that, is it, is that a common campaign terminology? Do, do people running for office know what a consumable 
campaign item is. Well, and this is where, again, we have a bit of a divide where uh, the pros who are, you know, uh, on the payroll for a federal campaign year round, they're the ones filing with our office, VSRs every time they give to make sure they're compliant because that's their job. But then the volunteer treasurer of a county party uh, typically has not had to report that. Um, and so uh, my recommendation to the board would be to mirror the language from the exception under the campaign property rule uh, in the in-kind contribution rule so that we're consistent throughout our reporting. And with what result? Uh, with the result of uh, less cumbersome reporting requirements. No reporting of it? No reporting of it. Thanks. Not a good threshold, just no reporting of it? Well, and, and that's where I wanted your input because I think the arguments are I could see both sides. Like a cup, a, a cup with someone's campaign information on it. Right. A, that you can use afterwards for coffee. Correct. Is that consumable or not consumable? That's consumable. And perhaps we want to revise the definition of consumable campaign property as well. Um, I think we may. Well, I, I, I think I think we may want to put like IE t-shirts, yes. cups. Mm -hmm. You know, to kind of just put a small list, like just a few things, so that people go, right. "Oh, that's what we're talking about." Absolutely, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that makes yeah. sense of this. It, right, because what I don't want is someone to look at the language of that have been permanently imprinted to be specific to a candidate or an election. I don't want someone to take a Sharpie on a laptop and put Joni Ernst 2026, and then it's exempt from reporting. Yes. I mean, thankfully we don't see those instances often, but there are some people out there who will try to, I always say, be cute and get around the law like that. Um, so uh, we definitely want to anticipate those moments. So there's yes. no ambiguity. My, my first, my lay person's first thought was consumable was like, a Milky Way bar or a oh. <laughs> apple <laughs> pie. Yeah. I mean, most people would think that. Yeah. Or was someone selling pies? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We had a pie complaint last we year. <laughs> well, I think you've heard that from the board. I mean, let's mm -hmm. let's define it. Let's give examples of it so that people who we expect to, to you know, comply with this regulation, understand what it is and what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But the other question is, do we do we require any reporting of any of this at all? Do we require reporting of this if it reaches a certain threshold, right? That's the question. Right. And uh, we have heard some feedback uh, where people generally don't want to report anything because that has been the status quo. Uh, the argument that we made in the office when we were deliberating was, well, if you have a thousand dollars worth of T-shirts, you're going to put that on your FEC report if it's for a congressional candidate. And then reporting something of that value uh, when it's given to like a county party, that would just have more disclosure and we would be able to follow the money, follow the items uh, easier. So that would be uh, the other side of the argument. I thought a few minutes ago I I was hearing from you that if that you know the consensus in the office was that there'd be no reporting. That's my personal opinion on it. I think there are some in the office who differ, and that's why again, and I could be swayed either way. I, I started with one opinion, then I went back, and now I'm kind of back in the middle. Where I think uh, there are plenty of reasonable options here. And it might also be the kind of thing, since we already have heard feedback from some county parties and uh, one of the state parties, uh, we might want to uh, open it up to some public comments um, to get their ideas. And uh, since they're more on the ground and dealing with this uh, in ways that some of us in the office are not. Yeah, do we have to decide this today? Any board members have any strong feelings about this? Or I, I'm just thinking about all the stuff we do at church and whatnot that we have like pens and t-shirts and cups and how quickly that the, the value of that climbs um people are giving out coffee mugs those those things especially if you're giving out a decent ceramic mug that thing's going to climb in value fast you're going to be at a thousand dollars before you know it mm -hmm. t-shirts too you're looking if you're going the cheap t-shirt it's 8.99 with just minimal screen printing so there's like, do we, if we are going to put a threshold, do we leave it up high 
ish thousand plus, not in that five hundred dollar range. So that I mean, I can see we do want to follow the money. That's part of what we're trying to do here is make sure that it's clean and good. And so if we just say we don't have to report anything, who's getting a queue? Mm -hmm. How do we make sure people aren't getting queued and slipping things through that crack of not reporting anything? Yeah. But, I, but I'm with you. I'm like, well, yeah. who's really spending that kind of money at accounting level? Right. Well, and uh, there are some instances where they might drop off pen signs. And uh, right now with the presidential campaign going on, uh, what I've heard from some county Republican parties is, you know, you show up and if you want a Nikki Haley sign, you can grab from that bunch. If you want a Trump sign, if you want a DeSantis sign, uh, and it is more of an intermediary. But I will also throw out there that if you look in the language for the existing campaign property rule, um, what we say is uh, you need to report it if it's 500 or more when it's acquired, and then it needs to be listed on each following report until the residual value falls under $100. So those are some numbers for consideration. Zach, have you asked any other states how they ha handle this topic? No, this issue just came up last week. And so we've been uh, rushing and uh, uh, just so you all are also aware, uh, I had someone from the Republican Party of Iowa reach out because uh, they had been hearing a lot from their county Republican parties. And what I told them for the time being was, until the board decides this and has more clarity, stick with the status quo, which is not reporting, um, because they did express that it would be a pretty significant change for the county parties. Leah, make, Leah makes a good point. And to my question, do we have to decide this today? I, I just don't feel any urgency in this. I don't mm -hmm. feel that comfortable even understanding it or what the problem is or anything else. Why, why don't you, you know, why don't you seek, you know, some, some, uh, some input from other COBO members and bring this back to us. And, yep. you know, with, with some more specifics, like this is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. This is the problem that we're going to have if we go one way or the other. This just seems a little premature to, to be deciding this without some more facts. And, right. and the, uh, I've never heard of this before. And I don't, and I'm not quite sure what consumable is even right. Mm -hmm. So, and this is, you know, we're in the process right now of reviewing all of our administrative rules. Another reason why I'm happy Taylor is here. Uh, our deadline is not until December of 2025, thankfully. So we have time. But as we look through the rules, there was a little bit of a cleanup to change things like our website address back in 2021. But in terms of like genuinely looking through the language and determining if we want to update and modify, I don't know the last time that was done. I think that's probably another example where it's time to update and refresh that might be the answer uh, what did you say jim i said i did it during the bill sack administration to show the other agencies how oh. we did it that was the point of the all um, i'm sure there have been clean up since then but yeah. let's is there consensus to put this discussion off to the next meeting and and ask that to bring back some more information Let's move on to the next thing. Uh, no, it's not an exact item. It's just discussion. But real quick on that, I'll get the facts and other what other states do. Does the board also want input, public comments from uh, county parties or whoever would want to weigh in on this issue, or just leave it to the facts for the time being? Well, wouldn't you think that would be helpful? Let's let's. Yeah, yeah. I think that'd be helpful. Those, those affected by whatever yep. decision we make. Let's. Well, the uh, we read your report on enforcement of civil penalties. The uh, that's an impressive follow up to our discussion at the last meeting. Any questions of Zach about about the the uh, this excellent report that he gave us? The you know and an excellent use you know you know in our discussion of of budgets uh, for the new members what you know. And we were given a million dollars to update our, our web-based reporting system, $500,000 each of two, two years in a row. And I see that you've harnessed that technology and using that technology to send out, you know, clearer, better, you know, letters to those, you know, those entities, those people we find and using that technology to kind of the, uh, you know, get those fines paid. What a dramatic increase. But but uh, great work. 
any questions of Zach about this excellent report that he gave us? So where do we, where do we go from here? Well, uh, and that's what I want the input on. So the, the first question I would have as we uncovered this and tried to just deal with the magnitude of it, I mean, there were penalties from the time when I was in diapers and that's been a while. Uh, so what I said- We don't want to get into any personal <laughs> thing here. <laughs> Bit TMI. Um, but what I said was, look, we're not gonna try to collect something from 2010. We said for all penalties from January 1st, 2018 to the present, roughly five years, we'll make an effort on those. The only exception would be if a committee has been active since 2010 and they still are active today. Um, so I just wanted to check in with the board to see uh, if they were comfortable with kind of the five year statute of limitations for lack of better phrase, um, or uh, if there was a, a difference yes. in the policy. Let's get, let's get the board members. The five yes, years I agree with five years. years. Yeah. Okay. yeah. There's been a, a great deal of, of uh, you know, you've done a great deal of recouping here. Uh, and Jonathan's question was, you know, what's next? You know, this the the number that jumped out at me was that 75% of the unpaid funds you know, were levied against what candidates who ran for the Iowa House and Senate. I mean, if that doesn't give us, you know, if, 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 if that isn't the, uh, you know, some strong evidence of facts that they would, I mean, I think in good faith, they will see that. Mm -hmm. And and doesn't this go to, you know, an, uh, an effort to change the law to give us, you know, the kind of enforcement power that you're talking about with this, you know, the, the driver's licenses? Correct. The, isn't that isn't that where we go here? But all of this data that you've compiled is is a you know that's our strong case. I mean, here yep. here's where we are. Give us this power, and we'll clean it up. But I would think that of that seventy five percent, the uh, you know they would take that to heart. That this is this the, the these are their houses. These are people who've run for both the House and the Senate who you know, who are running to write the laws in our state. And it's not just them, it's their opponents. I mean, we don't know who, 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 these are candidates for the House and Senate, not necessarily those who have been successful. Correct. But I would think we would, I would think this, they would be very receptive to changing the law, especially if it's people running for the legislature who won't pay their fines. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think, I think we're in a strong position. So this legislation was going to be part of the, the larger bill, right? And then there were amendments to it, and that's what sunk it, right? So we we got some attention on this last year because of a news story that aired in the Cedar Rapids market. Uh, it was the kind of thing where, given the magnitude of the problem and frankly the track record of pre-filed bills, uh, a lot of times those just get overlooked at the legislature. Uh, I believe very strongly that we needed to do something to really grab their attention. And when that story aired, it did just that. Um, and uh, the, one other quick point I want to know before I get back into your question, Jonathan, uh, is uh, the data for the exact dollar amounts that we have recouped. That data is hard to isolate for penalties that we've collected because we only quantify it as receipts. That's the category. So that also includes as cheats to the state uh, where a committee you know, gets an envelope of $500 and uh, doesn't know where the source is, so they have to send that in. But uh, roughly, including its sheets, which skews the data a little bit, I think we're looking at about a quadrupling uh, over, since we've started uh, the efforts. And uh, uh, it's a small drop in the total general fund, but uh, it still represents an effort. And so we have contributed four times more than we have in the past to the general fund. But I think Jonathan's point's a good one. I mean, you know, we had support for this even before all of the call of uh, you know, amassed all these statistics. We had support for this. It it was unsuccessful because an amendment was added to it. But with this additional information, the uh, I mean, the question is: okay. the uh, are we going back again? And and are, are we going to fight to have this? You know, a clean a, a clean bill without any amendments and 
with this data. I mean, let's fight for this. This should shouldn't this be one of our legislative priorities? This year? Well, and uh, that would lead nicely into the next agenda item. For some context, what I was told, because what happened was uh, we worked on the bill with the chair of the House State Government Committee, Representative Jane Bloomingdale, uh, who was a, a great partner and you know, can't thank her enough for uh, the dedication to uh, fix the problem. Um, because uh, I do also want to say that you know, 75% of these penalties, they're for state House and state Senate candidates. That doesn't mean that they're all the problem. I mean, there are so many of them who work hard, who work closely with our office to be compliant. And uh, you're right, I think they would want to have this problem resolved because they're putting in the effort to abide by the law. And if uh, some of their counterparts or uh, other candidates are not, that would be problematic. Uh, and uh, But the context I was given, when it first did not get democratic support in the House State Government Committee, it passed out of that committee on party lines the uh, the ranking member, Representative Amy Nielsen, told me that her members were concerned about the provision which was put in there by uh, a Republican representative, which would raise the gift uh, law exemption from the current level of three dollars to, I believe it was ten dollars and then index it to inflation year after year. Uh, so that was what I think scared them off a little bit. Uh, and then why it was not brought to the floor by the majority leader, uh, I can't say exactly. Um, but I do think that we have the information that shows that this is enough of a problem because the way I put it is if I get pulled over for speeding, going 60 and a 55, I could say that that's a minor violation. Like some people might say that violating one of our campaign laws is a minor violation. No one's dying. So it could be characterized as more minor. But if I don't pay that speeding ticket, there are going to be real consequences for me or any other everyday Iowan. But if people who are running for office and many of whom are in office are not held accountable to the point where they can violate the campaign laws, get a penalty issued from our board and have no problem if they completely ignore that penalty, then we have two different tiers and that is, uh, of justice. And that is just something that personally uh, gets me a little fired up. And there's so no, there's no objection around this table to that. Jonathan, did you? Well, <clears throat> I think we should. Um, really push hard for this to get support for this bill. And I think we should go to the governor, seek the governor's support for it. I think we should, whoever would be the designees, you certainly, or Jim, or uh, maybe the legislative leadership, and just let everyone know that this is a high priority and we feel strongly about it. I think the political parties, I don't believe that makes either political party what's good to have so many of their uh candidates or at least you know on paper it's 75 percent of, uh, of of who is owing this that uh you know i'd like to see the political parties take some ownership for this too even though you know each candidate runs her own campaign and so failing that if if this legislation goes nowhere, and I'm not optimistic it would in a short election year session like this will be, I'd like to suggest that we consider publication, make a point of publication to the scoff laws are, mm -hmm. yep. and circulate it among the news media. That's an interesting point. I wondered about the same thing. Yeah. And uh, the other thing that I, I made a note of in the memo, but because of different directors doing things differently, we don't have the clearest records right now, but I'm still sorting through the files of uh, penalties that are for uh, formal complaints that the board issues. So uh, when we've issued a $400 penalty for refusing to file um, in response to a formal complaint, all this data is tracked in our web reporting system. Um, we don't yet have the features. I hope to add them for board actions within the WRS, but for right now, these are just for late campaign reports. And so to me, the most egregious offenders are those who uh, violate and have a thousand dollar penalty for multiple violations, and then they continue to not pay. Absolutely. Leah, yeah. you were going to say something. No, I just saw Elaine was going to ask a question, so I wanted to make sure she got it asked no i'm fine thank you i just was i just had commented that i wondered about 
making this information available to a wider audience. Well, that would be a very powerful thing to say in a conversation to try to get people to support this, I would think. Mm -hmm. That yeah. the uh, that that uh, before the board is you know consideration of uh, you know publication of the delinquent forfeitures. The you know I I I I see consensus for this. The, uh, would you please check out the legality of this and, and run it past Kobel and see what other states do? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and the uh, you know, publishing the names of those who who've been fined. I mean, that would be a public record. It's public record when we when we assess the fine. This is you know, there's nothing. The uh, it's publicly available on the web reporting system. They can go in and look. And when that news story aired last year, we did have several individuals who went in and saw, uh, you know, oh, I had a penalty. I thought I paid it. Worked one on one with our auditors and cleared it up that way. Um, so yeah, there, we have a late report uh, viewable section on our web reporting system right now. Like I said, the only thing that is not publicly available would be uh, if there was a formal complaint and then the board here voted to file because that's. A paper order I write that's not within the system right now. So what I also heard John say is if, if we do take this as legislation, I think we're consensus that we are this is this is a halfway, this is a must. And it is completely ignored a legislature or tossed out that we go and we say, really? And we, we put it out to the press and to the public and say this is this is this is not something that should be ignored, right? Should ever be ignored. And also draw attention to the fact that we need the law to change and the very people, the only people who can change the law are the people who need to be policed by the law. Yeah, I think I think there will be support for this. I'm not there was support last year. The I think there will be support for this. You know, your idea is a powerful one. You're talking about your, your report uh, mentioned how if a committee owes a, a fine when they go back to file again, there's some red banner that you, yep. you owe this. You're talking about taking that to a whole new level where we let the you know the entire state know, well, here's our, you know, here here are 100 candidates for the Iowa legislature that have that have been fined for violating you know, campaign finance mm -hmm. laws or ethics laws who haven't paid their fines. And you know, maybe it's a maybe it's a new page on our web-based reporting system or a press release. Mm -hmm. That's what Jonathan's talking about. Mm -hmm. and, yep. and I think that's a powerful idea. And uh, because of the past efforts, we're at that point where if someone is unaware that they have a penalty, I don't know why. Maybe they haven't logged in. I mean, we have sent more notices because there were some just based on the past internal policies of the agency where uh, people got an, one notice or maybe it got lost or the email didn't get delivered five years ago. But now we have made such a concerted effort to make sure that people are aware so that uh, they can't dissolve their committee. When they log in, it's a bright red banner and they have a link so they can click on it and see, oh, I have two penalties. I missed that January report, that May report. We, we want to give them every opportunity they can to be aware of it and rectify it. Uh, and that's also why in the language that I've included in this memo, we made it so the policy that I took from the judicial branch when I worked with Representative Bloomingdale, the consequence of suspending the violator's driver's license, that would only be, I believe it's on the third notice, and we require restricted certified mail so that if it is Zach Goodrich who has been the violator, we will have confirmation that I received the letter, I, uh, you know, uh, I've signed the release from the post office to get the letter so that there's no situation where someone can come back and say, uh, you're going after me, but I didn't know about this. We want to go on the people who do know about it. Now that your predecessors haven't had yep. to send out these multiple reminders and the rest of it. So it, it, it's all good. Any other comments? You can you can see the consensus here. The, you know, the seriousness with which with which all members are taking this. Yeah. So that's the answer to Jonathan's question. Where yeah. what's what where we go forward from here? And to another point he made, uh, I, I do think just the nature of 
the legislature. When you start adding in amendments, I mean, there were things about campaign signs. It was a big omnibus bill to change a lot of things. Uh, it just becomes a lot harder where when you're trying to do uh, 20 different things in one bill. Um, and uh, so that's why I think our strategy for this year and with Taylor's experience as well is going to be a very big help um, where we can focus and have some very simplistic bills that way. Uh, if they don't take action on it, um, we can say it's because you didn't want enforcement. It's not because you didn't want the campaign sign regulation to change. We simplify it and we uh, uh, make the argument as strongly as possible. And we'll talk more about this in our open door meeting, right? But the, uh, you know, maybe, you know, as Jonathan is suggesting here, we have one bill and this is it and we put it all on this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a short session. I mean, this business of what, we're gonna come in with five, the, uh, you know, let's have a discussion in November of whether we come in with just one and put it all on this. Mm -hmm. Yep. The, could, to show our seriousness. Could, could you clarify for me the steps of what we're talking about? One, this is going to be a, a request for legislation where, and, and then what would, if they choose not to vote on it, then we move to public, uh, more of a more of a a public awareness campaign to make people aware of it or what's help me with the process right and i think that was jonathan's suggestion but i'm hopeful that the legislature will respond okay. to that so that 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 the parties will come together they were they were there last year okay it wasn't because of this that that this this the uh that this didn't pass. It was because okay. of something that was added to it. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I, you know, let's, I don't think we, it, it's the time to okay. go to plan B and, and not assume that. But I think what Jonathan was saying was, you know, if, 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 uh, if the law isn't changed, then the options that we have include, okay. you know, the more prominent publication of those who, who, who haven't paid their fines. All right. Um, I, I just wanted clarity, so thank you for that. Now, do we need anything, any other board members have anything to say about this? Not specifically about this. Um, I, but anything else? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's act over. Um, I was just going to say, uh, Elaine, maybe this is some clarifying information that would help you as well. Um, so just with the calendar of the legislative process, and also for my own comfort as the director, if we got to that point where we need the plan B to do a media blitz to get as many eyeballs on this problem to really force their hand, I would not want to do anything before consulting with you all. So we have a clear plan. I, I really don't want that to be left to me to formulate alone for many reasons. Um, and I think that would be around the time where we would meet in the spring anyway. That, listen, we are not saying that we are pessimistic about this. Mm -hmm. We're saying based on what they did last year, that we think they, they will support this. Absolutely. So, you know, let's look at him. The, uh, let's just come back to it if we have a problem. Yes. And the, the press is hearing a lot of, you know, what, what we do if, if the legislature doesn't change the law. Mm -hmm. but, but, but that only kicks in if they don't change the law. Right. So uh, let's give them the chance to change the law. Yeah. The, Dan? Um, we had talked, I believe, last year, maybe the year before, I can't remember the kind of time frame. We had talked about when someone's doing an online contribution, clicking the recurring thing and that make, making seeking oh, legislation like, on that. Mm -hmm. Did that fail as well? Yeah, that did not even get a subcommittee that meeting. That was dead on arrival. Um, we, we would have been one of the kind of first states to really push in the front running states. We would have been the second state. Second. Uh, it, it was primarily a problem at the federal level. Um, <laughs> <laughs> One of the first, sorry. First, <laughs> <laughs> gotta be gotta be precise with the law, man. Um, uh, but to that point, leading into the last uh, topic for discussion of the preliminary discussion of the legislative proposals, um, we went around. We asked the staff what would be on their wish list. Uh, I think for all of us, we would love for the campaign sign regulations to be changed because there is, depending on the size of the sign, the law is different. But there was. Uh, not even a neutrality about that last year. They did not want to touch that. Uh, the only other thing, I agree that the enforcement needs to be priority number one. The thing that I've heard from all around the state and over at the Capitol, uh, a very simple bill to reflect the fact that 
for the past 10 plus years, we've had electronic filing, change the filing deadline from 4.30 p.m. to 11.59 because you no longer have to get the paper copy into our office by the close of business. What do you think of that? I think we talked about that in April. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a no-brainer. No yes. Makes sense to me. Yep. And then if there were any other ideas that board members had, uh, we just wanted to use this as a brainstorming session so that uh, we could develop and have the specific language to bring to you in November because the deadline for pre-filed bills is the Monday after Thanksgiving. Uh, so we, we don't want to spend a whole bunch of time working out the specific language. Uh, if we... well, anyone with other ideas other than these other than these that we've talked about? I would love to see the check the box thing taken up, but I feel before you go writing, I feel let's put our efforts into enforcement. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I think that that that's such a slippery slope that people can just get tabbed for money over and over and over again and not even have a conscious idea that's happening. But I do think enforcement, I, I personally feel that enforcements are our big our big shoot for the star kind of thing. Let's get that. Mm -hmm. Leah, Elaine, any ideas? I don't have anything else at this point. No. Well, the Jim, I did have one question about um, a new board member. Do, is there timing of, of that? Well, there's been a, no, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments, questions? Well, this is sure a great system. This this new technology that you found. Our our two board members up there on that screen. It's just it's like you're right here with us, and even better looking than than we are. Those are that is, you know, on Zoom or something. When when we use it, I. You don't look good. This is good. I never do. This is good. Well, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thank you. See you in November. Yep. Thanks, guys. Good to see you. Bye. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks for everything you've done. Yeah, now we just turn off the. Okay, now we're no longer.